What's up, everyone? Welcome back. In today's episode, we talked to Martina Spotsius, uh, called the Marty McFly, because we went back into the future a little bit today. And we talked about his uh, journey to the US, uh, as well as reflecting back on his career a little bit. Uh, but the bulk of the discussion was about retirement and the path to it, um, the injuries he went through, battling injuries, recovering from them, and what led to his retirement. Uh, essentially finding a new job and finding a new identity, um, finding balance in his life. We touched also on the coaches that he played for, uh, Coach K, Coach Pablo Lasso, and some some common denominators amongst them, as well as certain strengths and weaknesses that um, we discussed in many different aspects, not only coaching. And the assistant coaches that he worked and worked with, uh, what he expected from them and what he appreciated the most out of assistant coaches. I think that there's a lot of good lessons there for lots of um, aspiring coaches or current coaches. So listen to this episode if you're curious about um, one of the, well, high level players of the past in, in Lithuanian basketball as well as international basketball. Um, please also subscribe to this channel, uh, subscribe to all the podcast platforms that you're using, like it, comment it. If you don't like it, don't like it, but I'm very happy if you're a subscriber and I will continue to bring in guests to uh, broaden our horizon together and hopefully grow together. So please tune in, enjoy this episode and see you soon. Action. Marty McFly. What's up, Marty? <laughs> hey, Venice. Good to see you. We're talking English. Two Lithuanians talking English again. Yes, it's, uh, I'm kind of used to it now by this, by this point, you know, whether it's Arturas last few years in the, in yeah. the office or now Tommy. Uh, kind of used to it. <laughs> yeah, we lived in the States for so long, whether it's Arturas, Tommy, you, me, like it's, it seems fairly natural for us to talk English and more so for me a lot of times because i didn't grow up in lithuania at all uh, or like I'm five years old whatever but uh it just seems like second nature or first nature almost to to us when we talk uh, we talk slang we talk quick and it's it's kind of easy way of expressing so, so to some people it might sound weird but for us I've, for me it seems natural it is i mean and you know your podcast is more international right now you're trying to reach other um you know audiences so i think it's way more makes way more sense and yeah it, it's kind of become natural you you catch yourself thinking in english more times than not you know so yeah i think it's normal yeah yeah people ask me what what language do i dream is i i, I don't know i dream in all languages I I <laughs> for me i think it's both sometimes for it's one sometimes the other for me, for me, German sneaks in there too. <laughs> um, um, talking about Fly, McFly, I don't know if you heard that nickname or not. I just made it up because I, I want to go back, back into to the future. The, back to the future with you a little bit. But talking about Fly, uh, your IG is very fly to me. I, I uh, you know, when, when I started following you, I was wondering, I, yesterday I was scrolling back to see when you started to put all the shades and colors in there, the, the, the filters. And it dated back to, I'm just counting the one that you go from black to, to colored. And it was like July 2016 after your wedding. So I'm wondering if your wife has something to do with that. No, she has zero to do with it. But I would say it's more um, when I really, really started doing it. I would okay. say right as I was retiring. You know? Oh, okay. I, okay. I would have like one or, you know, one picture here or there, but I never, it was just like, whatever. And then, yeah, and then I think, you know, it's kind of towards the end of my last season, I think I really, if I'm not mistaken, you know, I think I really, I was kind of like, yeah, I'll, I'll just do that. And then it just kind of, that just happened now. If I have a nice picture of something, I'm just, I just can't put it because I can't, you know, I can't color something. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good follow. At, at, at M. Potsis, is it? At M. Potsis? I think yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it's it's uh, the first one that stood out was Trafalgar Square, where it was just like the the British colors of the flags stood out, and everything else was black and white. And then after that, it was just took in, taken off. Sometimes you 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 put something else in there, but in general, I love I love your I, Instagram. So it's it was. You know, uh, I used to love the photography and you know all the like all the cool apps that used to be like I would try to you know like improvise and like try to it was interesting to me. 
and then kids happened and then now it's just kind of like you know i have a dji drone sitting in the closet collecting dust and you know all the gear that i used to have <laughs> it's just i haven't used it in like three years you know since my kids were born so yeah that that's that's a different story so what's that's what's like, the filter what's the filter you use for that what's the what's the program you use for that i think it's called a color splash so it's color very splash. easy you know just, okay. yeah it's just it does everything where you know picture goes black and white and you just yeah. color whatever you want so yeah, it's fairly okay. easy and straightforward all right so today we'll play uh we're gonna go into the uh, the backstory a little bit but i prepared three periods for us um basically we're playing uh hockey today nhl three periods it's like the the boston bruins versus the colorado avalanche <laughs> which is as long as we don't get into any fights today <laughs> Um, so the first part was personal. Then we go a little bit into your career and coaching. Um, coaching in terms of what you experienced uh, through working with high-level coaches and assistant coaches. And then we go into the main bulk of the discussion, which is retirement, because that's the thing that I want to focus on the most with the current uh, discussions I'm having with, with ex-players or um, just fairly recent retired players, etc. So t just going into your bio a little bit, I looked up uh at duke you finish with international comparative studies so explain yourself with that one marty it sounds like a a study that where your assistant coaches help you out with that a little bit <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm I wish just it was no i wish it was you know but but it's duke so i did have to work for you know for of course of course i'm just kidding um yeah so uh international comparative studies it was probably um you know i did not i did not know what i wanted to do or where i wanted to major you know i guess my first after my first couple of years at duke and but you know i took a lot of classes that had something to do whether it was geography whether it was something international um you know and then i looked at it after two years now that you know this international competitive studies kind of sounded, sounded kind of interesting and i was like what is it and it's basically, I think the major has changed right now, what it's called, um, but it's basically a little bit of everything, but it's whether, you know, from international business to geography to history, it's all, it's kind of like rounded into everything international, so to speak, um, you know, so it was a lot of different classes that just touch everything that's not just US, but it's everything um, very broad, but everything everything international, so to speak. So it came, you know, a little bit of business, a little bit of finance, a little bit of history, a little bit of geography, all that kind of stuff. So it's like a kind of inc inclusive, uh, all inclusive, basically package. Um, but was there like some kind of uh, interpersonal or personality? Um, it's got some anthropology to it because what I what right. I what it, I Google what I when I Googled it a little bit. Right. Um, it does have a little bit of that as well. I mean, it was just, you know, it was more I wanted to get a degree. I did not I did not know what I wanted to major in. And this, you know, this major kind of just popped out at me as, you know, I had a lot of credits already towards it. And I was just like, well, let's roll with it. Um, you know, um, I took Russian, you know, I took Russian classes <laughs> as well. So um, you could say it's cheating because I spoke a little bit, but, you know, I learned how to write and read, you know, so um, it definitely helped me in that regard. <laughs> that that reminds me of his personal story as well when I, I went to the i went to high school my first year in uh, in shreveport louisiana and i came over from germany and um i went into you could have some elective courses right you can have uh special courses you just elect you can change if you don't like it mm -hmm. and i had because uh, i love math i took math course and it was um advanced math uh i forgot out no, it was it was advanced math and i got to the i got to the um, to the equation to the final result in a different way than the teacher did because in germany there was two different ways to get to it you know and the equation right. turned out to be right but the teacher and i would disagreed on how the, the process that she only knew that way and right. i knew it a different way and it was it was um she's like yeah I, I can't teach you your way you like you have to adjust to me and i was like um all right i uh, it took me a while i was like I'm I'm gonna take a German class, so I took German, <laughs> and the teacher was Ger the teacher was German. I was like, all right, let's just like I'm just gonna go ahead, just one year, whatever. Like I'm I'm just gonna go ahead. Right. But um, thinking, talking about going to the U.S. as a young age, because we both went over in high school. You went to prep school, 
and you went at a fairly young age because um, you went two years to prep school, as I remember, right? Mm -hmm. So you were Correct. like six, 16 when you went over? Probably 16, 17, right, right around there, yeah. So it is, it is a pretty hard and early adjustment at that age. What would you advise or what do you remember you struggled with the most early on, being away from your parents, being away from your family, friends at that age? It's a crucial, crucial age for a kid to be formed. I was, went over and I was 17. And it's, uh, I remember it was it, around Christmas time was the tough part where you were right from your family, you're like you're all, all of a sudden eating pizza for, for, uh, <laughs> for, yeah. uh, for dinner. Like it is, it was a different, it was a different experience. It was a different culture experience, but it, you know, you're far away from everything. So how did you remember that time and what do you struggle with the most? What would you advise other players that going over to maybe, um, prepare themselves for? Um, so, you know, so my transition to the States, or I guess like the way I ended up there was very quick, not transition, but like, basically, you know, I was, I was already playing, I think, second to last year at uh, Marcellonis Academy, you know, and I was playing with a uh, one year older guys. And I was already at that point where I was starting to, you know, feel like I'm, I'm not saying better, but like I was, you know, I was reaching the level where I could, I was thinking about playing possibly in LKL and I had no, really no interest. And, you know, I was already the MVP of the, at the certain age, you know, when I was playing in Lithuania and I was, we kind of started thinking with my family, with my dad and mom, you know, what would be great next steps. And, you know, it was a boom of kids from Lithuania just going to the States. You know, yep. it was at that time where it was very popular and a lot of my friends went and, you know, there's some success stories where whether it's Linus Kleza, you know, he went and, yep. um, and Derry Sangaila before it. So it was, it was sort of popular and that was an idea where, I, so I just went to a, to a camp with Astapas Kiris, you know, in mm -hmm. Shaluta, I believe. And I just went there for half a day, played pickup and he's like, yeah, sure. Like, give me two days. So literally from, from the time when my family and I sat down and we're like, Hey, maybe us would be a possibility to the time where I stepped on campus in the States. It was one week, literally. Like I went, you know, to the camp, he called me two days later. I got, you know, basically the visa and everything. And I, like a week later, I was on campus already. So the change for me is just like that, you know, so a week after I'm sitting on camps, I'm like, whoa, what just happened? You know, everything just changed completely. Um, but I, I was lucky because, you know, I, I went to prep school and it was, a, it was a very small school. It was not a public school. It was a um, high tuition. So good kids. Um, uh, my high school coach really helped me out, you know, to kind of get settled and everything. So I really got lucky in the sense of, you know, I did not have to... Um, do like a drastic change or drastic, you know, period where it's, you know, you hear horror stories of some kids going to high, you know, public high schools or whatever. You yeah. know? So for me, it was actually a very good situation where I did feel comfortable, but yeah, I did struggle with, you know, all the, I was foreign kid and I was foreign kid. I did not understand the slang. I did not understand, you know, the culture, um, you know, you watch movies, you watch shows, but it's different, you know, remember first time somebody asked me hey what's up i just looked up and you know started like just <laughs> just stupid stuff that you know just you know people ask me like what dorm are you in i don't know what dorm is you know and yeah, it's just yeah. you just you just kind of learn every single day a ton of new like let's say my english or my accent wasn't bad but my vocab was wasn't great you know it was just like lack of a lot of words you know so yeah. i was learning a lot of words every single day um um, but like I said, you know, the, the atmosphere and the high school, you know, the prep school was, was small and it was cozy and it was easy to get adjusted to, you know, um, I did start struggling, you know, as far as missing home, you know, come Christmas time, come, you know, all these holidays. Um, and, you know, still back in, that was 2003, I want to say, you know, like Skype was just basically arriving, you know, like there, there was no FaceTime, no you know, instant messages, the what's WhatsApp, whatever. Like it was literally you just sit down to the computer and write a long ass email, you know, yep. just your story, yep. everything you send it. And then you wait for it the next morning or two days later, you know, you wait to hear from. So those are the com communications. So maybe it was a little bit harder because of that, you know, you couldn't get on FaceTime and talk to your family. So that part was kind of, was kind of hard. Um, but then, you know, like I said, you know, for me, basketball was everything. I spent a lot of time in the gym. 
you know, because I was used to it and then slowly sort of kind of, you know, got got through it and got adjusted. And then, you know, after my first year, um, I basically I called Tommy, you know, who's the assistant GM right now with the Nuggets. I called Tommy. And I was like, you got to come, you know, there's an awesome situation, you know, yep. he was still playing and, you know, he came. And, you know, I had another Lithuanian, so it was much easier. You know, it was one of my best friends. So we, right away, you know, we kind of, um, it was definitely an easier period the next year. Yeah, it sounds like it was a soft landing early on. And then, you know, like through basketball, you 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 kept yourself occupied mentally through by being in the gym and staying away from the distractions. And then Tommy came and made your life happier. <laughs> yeah, pretty so, much, pretty much. Yeah. You know, we, we were two men, you know, two man crew that just were we were just all all the time together. But I was already yeah. sort of like, you know, more adjusted to the US life after one year because, you know, whether it was teammates, um, uh, whether it was a coach uh, or other people just in a, 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 in high school, like a lot of people just kind of embraced me and helped me, you know, yeah. to, to really uh, get acclimated. So it was fairly soft land, like you said, yeah. Yeah, I feel like those like I went to a, to a small private school to my first year and those it feels more personal. Everything is more family and it's more it's right. closer to each other and that you feel obliged to help each other, whatever that is. And as, especially there's a lot of foreign kids in my school. So there was a foreign um, vibe going on, um, not necessarily from Europe, but all over. Like we had some from uh, West Indies and, and St. Vincent and like it was a Ukraine kid, a little Lithuanian kid, but it was you you and you feel like you're you're your pals because you're all helping each other right. you all want to like you're all going through the same thing basically and everybody's there to achieve their goals so it's naturally like that environment a small environment helps i think if you go into a big like you said public school it's a little bit of a uh could be too big of a challenge for some kids to stay focused you're kind of so, more on your own yeah it's it's a little bit more different yeah because i remember yeah we had a ton of international kids too um you know, we had our hockey program was big. So, you know, we had a lot, yeah. of, you know, whether it's, you know, from Sweden or Norway or, you know, just uh, soccer, you know, guys from England, yeah. South Korea, yeah. it, it was, it was a lot of people, but I remember, you know, dude, I remember like yesterday when I like, walk into U S history class, you know, my first or second week and, you know, I sit through it and just kind of like, you know, and then I get a homework and a homework is, I think, you know, to read about 15 pages of U S history, whatever it was. I sit down and it took me half an hour to read one page that first night. I was like, all right, US history next year. I'm go I'm taking math. You know? <laughs> I dropped that class right away. Numbers are math. simpler, yeah. Yes, yes. You know, so it was it was an adjustment, you know, as far as English goes. Yeah, I remember my um, you know you have to take the ACT AC, did you have to take the SAT or ACT? S SATs. I took I took the ACT and it was also, you know, the reading segment. And it just halfway through the year, I had to go and do the reading segment and you get like 45 minutes or 30 minutes and I'm reading and I'm like at the third page trying to figure out and it's like time is almost over. You have to turn to the next subject. I'm like, oh, no, like I just started marking something, you know, you're trying to get that score to qualify and it's just I panic think I sensitive. did. A, I think I did a PSATs like two months in, you know, so to be it's like a, just a pre preparation, prep, prep, yeah. you know, to like, a, yeah. So I remember really doing it where I. You know, I just do math portion and the English portion. I did not even look. I looked at it. Like, yeah, I'm just going to sit and wait until math portion time, math portion, <laughs> English. Nope, nothing. So I was nearly perfect in, uh, in math. Um, and then, you know, the English, I was zero for a PSAT. I just did not even try because I was like, yeah, no chance, you know. And it's crazy because, you know, when you're in Lithuania, I was a fine student, but I was an A student, you know, because it's basketball and everything. And so... English was almost one of my most difficult subjects. You know, mm -hmm. I remember the year before I left, I want to say I had six out of 10, you know, in Lithuania. So that's, yeah. that's not great. No. You know, and then I come, and I come to the States, the prep school that's, you know, strong in math and everything. And you're like, this is easy. It's like, you know, like I was an A student in, in calculus, you know, so it was a very different um, levels, I would say. I got, I got lucky because I, when my parents went to, the, to Germany uh, for the first year, halfway through the year, through the season of my dad's season, we went to live in the States with my mom for half a year just to uh, explore. So I went to American, high, uh, American elementary school as a six-year-old, five or six-year-old. So I already had the basics. And then when, we learned, when I started learning it in Germany the next 10 years uh, or starting in sixth, uh, fifth grade, I was already advanced. So I came to the U.S. and the first time my high school coach picks me up is like, 
how was your flight? How was this? And I was like, you can talk to me normal, man. It's all good. Like I can. <laughs> so I got I got lucky in that sense. I was I was very um, eager and, yeah, and, and I remember and, my high school coach asking me like, do you have trees in Lithuania? Do you have trees? <laughs> you know, I mean, he, yeah. was, he was semi joking, you know, but it was just uh, like I got that every single day. Yeah, there's there's so, some odd questions waiting. Um, one yeah. more thing I wanted I wanted to ask you about your personal, and I don't want to get too much into it because you heard that question a million times, and I don't want to mm -hmm. talk about your 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 finger injury. But I was wondering, mm -hmm. um, like, the process, you know, like for those who don't know, Marty lost uh, three fingers, one finger, uh, two fingers uh, were halfway cut, and one is totally cut, right? Yeah, it was like so. One was completely; it wasn't cut; it was just mashed. That's why they couldn't okay. attach. Okay. Three fingers were cut the other two were attached so kind of yeah. you know um yeah so that happened in fifth or sixth grade in the woodshop class you know but i don't know if there's a question but basically yeah. it was it kind of set I, me up for for everything you know sorry to interrupt i i yeah. like i was going to go into more of the 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 process afterwards of how you went on training and not giving up on playing because you were playing before but how did you right. not give up on that and who trained who gave you because lithuanians in a good sense we are stubborn we are stubborn we are gritty we are um goal oriented and i feel like this is like an a example of how to really fight and grit have to grit and fight through it and not to really give up. But I was wondering who in your environment, maybe, or was it natural that you kind mm -hmm. of trained? And how did you tr continue to train afterwards? How long? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was all my dad, you know, and mm -hmm. really, I think if not for that injury, I don't even know if I would be where I am right now, or as far as like, I don't know if I would have had the career that I had just because, you know, when it happened, it was fifth or sixth grade, I was I was doing fine in basketball, you know, basketball was my dream because my dad was playing and I was following basketball from a little age. But that's when I was told, basically, there's a chance you're never going to play basketball again, you know. And for me, it was that's kind of where everything kind of flipped and changed. And I was, you know, my dad, I remember he every single day, you know, he would say, you know, you're different. If you want to be the same like everybody else, you got to work twice as hard. You know, and that was my that's what I was after every single day, you know, it was a hard, but I remember, you know, it was, it was really my dad just, you know, um, we Pushy. really worked hard. Yeah. He pushed me hard and we worked hard and, you know, there's good days, there's bad days, but, um, you know, I would wake up at six in the morning before school, you know, and go in the gym with him. And, you know, like he was there all the time and we worked and then after school, we go to practice normal practice. So, um, because of that, you know, and because of my dad, ever from sixth grade to, you know, it took me maybe one year to fully come back. But then, you know, I went like this, just because yep. my work ethic was I was working twice as hard. And really, I went from being middle of the pack of all my guys and all my peers. to I really, I mean, took off to where I was, you know, best guy on the team and, you know, started making national junior national teams and all that. And it was all because um, it, it was just, you know, the work ethic that I kind of, you know, from sixth or seventh grade that I really um, embraced. And really, that was main thing. Also, you know, when I got to high school uh, in prep school in the States, that's the only thing I knew was just working hard in the gym. And, you know, that's where all my free time went. You know, if people didn't know where I was, they went to the gym and I was there all, all the time. So it really because of this, you know, I changed my work ethic and my habits and everything. And I think because of this, you know, I did, uh, you know, came to the level that, you know, I reached the level that, that I was at because, you know, if I did not get injured and I stayed at the same, I might have been a mid-pack player, you know, middle level. Yeah. Um, it really that that uh work ethic that you know my dad instilled into me and that you know kind of chip on my shoulders so to speak yeah yeah uh really helped me to to reach everything that i did i really truly believe that so th that's definitely an example of of um persevering and and fighting through and then taking the next step and then it just kind of like you said it takes off and i was going to ask you this question later but since you touched on this um work ethic and and uh, being a gym rat and talk and like just applying yourself 120 percent um i'm just going to ask that later but i think that's it's it's very important for maybe for other natural gym rats to know is there a limit or not do, do you think 
uh, you ran yourself into the ground at, at the end uh, to a certain degree because you were so immersed in, in, in working hard because that's what, you, what got you to the next level and you thought there was no different way? Or is that something that is just like personal based and it's it, it just, um, you know, like some injury plagued season that we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, a career, sorry. But in, in terms of like running yourself into the ground through the gym, because I, I'm, I'm talking also out of experience because I, I, mm -hmm. I even had to finish earlier my career for similar reasons. I, I, I was, you know, like exhausted. My, my body's just said, no, uh, uh, and my body was probably right. not made for that 120% uh, engine. Some people are more naturally athletic and more naturally, uh, maybe talented, but somebody has to compensate in a different way. So I'm wondering if you go back and look back in your career, would you have at a certain point, uh, maybe not loosen the screws a little bit, but um, paced yourself a little bit better? That's a great question. And, you know, I never really thought about it until now um, because, you know, I did, I, I want to think I really did work hard my whole career, but um, I don't think there's necessarily a level where you go too far or you push yourself too much, but I think, if I had to go back and do things over again, it would be, you know, work smarter, not harder um, to the, in the sense that my problem was it was either a hundred or zero, you know? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is like, I played way too much through injuries, you know, mm -hmm. to where I broke my down, my, my body even, even more. Um, to where, you know, if I, if I had to go back, I would still work crazy hard. But then when, you know, the, the injuries, the pains, like that kind of stuff happened, I, I would probably be more smarter with my body as far as, you know, for me, it was literally as far as I can remember, you know, from Duke days, uh, to my eight professional seasons overseas. So probably for 10 plus years. I was on anti-inflammatories every single day, you know, and that's just not a good thing for your body, you know. So mm -hmm. um, if I if I wake up in the morning and I can't walk down the stairs and, you know, I'm struggling, it's, you know, it's anti-inflammatory pill. It's you go to the gym if it's a game, another, sh you know, shot in the butt and you're numb and you play and the next morning again, you can't walk, you know, but yeah. I literally did that my whole career. And that's, I think, where my body really, really broke down because, you know, it was just numb maybe yeah basically, you don't you, know? you don't feel the the the, the right the, so the damage, i was just going know? going going through that damage until something really broke down you know and then, and then i have to have surgery and recovery process and then again 100 percent, you know so i'd be way more smarter uh smarter about my body and you know just not pushing myself over the limit you know um but yeah as far as you know as far as working hard and having that work ethic i think you can I think you can be a maniac, you know, Kobe is a prime example. You can yes. be a maniac, but you also have to invest in your body and recovery. Yes. I think it's as important as hard work is, you know, and I did understand that at the time. It was work, 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 and nothing else, you know. I said that's another, again, we go back to the, the grit and the stubborn. Like, I, I was the same way, and I'm not saying a stubborn in a bad way. You know, like, I, you have to understand, I... I I feel like the, you know, I was also taking Voltaren and, and all these, all these pills shots just to calm my body down. And then you kept accumulating the, the damage. So the lesson would be uh, to not only listen to your body, but the, 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 the damage control you do with the pills at some, there's a tipping point at some point that you have to be aware of. And there's also people around you that are supposed to give you this warning as well. And as, as stubborn as the player is, I'm not talking about you and me now, I'm talking about other players they should be able to, they should trust that person who's telling them to also, of course, coaches want to have success. They can't, they can't handle if the player is out, but there's also a, a loss, loss benefit, you know, like there's at some point there's diminishing returns of that because you're going to lose the player long-term. So it's very important. I think the lesson here is to not to be too immersed in, in, in taking the pills and playing because it's a short-term reward and a long-term damage for the team, for the players, for the coach, for the player itself. And also, um, there's a lot of information out there, more information out there now than it used to be, you know, 10, even 10 or 15 years ago at all. So I think you have to be also able to understand it. And on the other side, I think you're not supposed to also 
use that as an excuse. Like you're supposed to push yourself until that limit, you know, so it is, it's a right. fine line. It is a very fine line. And, you know, it's, I wish I had, you know, the brain that I have right now when I was playing, you know, and <laughs> just when you're a 20 year old kid, it's all about, you know, you want, you want the results, you want to, you want to score, you want to be a, you know, the best player you can be and everything else. Like you don't think about long-term, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and again, I think Europe or international game is very different than, you know, let's say NBA. So, you, you know, I always said, if I, if I ever played in the NBA, I probably would have played much longer, you know, just because it's, I never understood when I was playing internationally, you know, I never understood how guys in the NBA um, get injured and, you know, are out for a month or two and then come back in the first game back, they score 30 or 35, you know, it's just like, it seemed impossible because in Europe, if you can walk, you can play, you know, it's yeah. just that kind of mentality where, yeah. you know, like you're, you're the second you can sort of run on a court and do a little bit of stuff, you're out, you know, and yeah. you ease your way into it. You know, NBA is different. They, yeah. they care about it where they, you know, you really, you go through the entire process of getting back and getting back in shape and playing and practice three on three, then it's five on five. Then you know, when you really, really back, then you go back on a court, you know, so that there's one big difference, let's say international and NBA game that um, I wish, you know, I wish uh, European teams or, you know, coaches or whatever could afford doing that, but, you know, you know, very well that that's not the case. Yeah, it's it's a different, um, not only mentality, but it's a different, there's, the stakes are different, you know, the the, the, the pressure is different. It's, 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 the pressure is on both sides, it's just different in, uh, on, on, mm -hmm. in, on this side of the pond. Um, but I'll go off the script here now, because I, I want to keep continuing, continuing down this path. If you think about, you finished your career when you were 31. Right. Like if I, if my math, so. if my math that I had, in I high think school, I just turned 31. I think that's correct. Yeah. The advanced math class that I took helped me out in this research. <laughs> um, I got to the same equation as you did. So um, did you did you anticipate that uh, happening already as you were getting closer to retiring or was that something that was like, all right, that's it, I'm finished. Or were you like thinking about it already? coming uh into the last season with Mauricio about no it. really um you know I guess we we almost have to go back a little bit you know to answer this question properly I think you know for me if you look at my playing career you know I I played four years at Duke then I you know as a rookie I came to Jalgiris and played there two years you know then it was Real Madrid then Jalgiris again then let's see Galatasaray um, um what I want to say in that is you know I really ever since Duke ever, ever since you know high school let's say wherever I was playing I was playing on pretty much the best team um, at that level you know whether it's Duke it's always you're competing for national championship yep. you know Jalgiris you are always expected to win Lithuanian let's say league you know and then compete in your league um, Real Madrid, same. It's the best team in Europe. You know, you're, the goals are always to win and win and win. And at some point when my body started breaking down and, um, and I couldn't perform at the, you know, let's say at the level that I wanted to and that I was used to, um, that pressure of winning and underperforming personally it was kind of piling up and adding up to the point where, you know, you know how it is in Europe a lot where it's for me my whole career it was about you know you win a game whew, thank god you're supposed to win on to the next one you lose yeah. a game it's you know it's it's the end of the world you win the game it's a relief yeah. you know it's not there's no joy yeah. so it was almost you know the joy of winning a game or something was very rare as far as like you know you win something with a national team you yeah. know, or you win a championship, you know, you're kind of, but a lot of times after seasons, I was more drained mentally than physically. Mm -hmm. um, and especially my last year in Jalgiris, where it was hands down the toughest year for me personally, just because my mom passed away that year. And I was really, really struggling, you know, with everything. And after that year, I told myself, I will never, ever play in Lithuania again. And I, I wanted to go to Australia. I wanted to go as far away as I can, you know, mm -hmm. from, from home, from Lithuania, from all the critics, from whatever it was. Um, and I was really, I'm done with Lithuanian basketball. I'm done with 
you know, just because it was personally a mental struggle for me, I really wanted to go to Australia. But by that time, the teams were already basically in Australia all set and mm -hmm. I could not. And the opportunity came, you know, to play in Murcia. And since I have some Spanish friends, you know, from, from Real Madrid days, I would hit all of them up, you know, like, what do you think? What do you think? And it was almost the best thing for me because it was, you know, middle of pack ACB team with not that kind of pressure. It was, yeah. it was really for me what I needed as far as enjoying basketball, yeah. enjoying winning games. You know, you win ACB game on a Sunday afternoon, everybody's happy, you know, yeah. and you're enjoying it. And there's not this you know high level of pressure there's pressure always you know but it's different it's very different um so i really enjoyed it and i really coming that season i thought i'm gonna play for another three years or so two three years at least you know because i still kind of thought my body would hold up and to the point where you know halfway through the year i realized it's just it's getting bad to the point where you know my last season uh, we had a coaching change, uh, you know, Portis Katsikaris came in and I actually got along with it great. Um, I, I loved having him as a coach, although we had that kind of a, you know, perception of being a very hard coach and whatnot. But, you know, for me, um, we, uh, listen, my last probably three seasons, uh, my last three months of my last season was really, you know, I would play a game on Sunday afternoon, let's say in the ACB. It was a Euro Cup was already done. Um, I, on Monday, I would, you know, get get the blood taken out of, you know, out of my vein, get that, you know, the plasma, yep. get the shot into my knee uh, of the plasma. The next three days, do nothing, you know, because you can't even walk after that. That's a serious shot. On Friday, you probably shoot around a little bit. On Saturday, you practice a little bit with the team. And on Sunday, you play those 12 or 15 minutes. Yeah. And all over again next week, yeah. you know, so it's, I was barely playing. I was barely practicing. Um, so I, you know, and that was a point where I spent so much time on the sidelines in a practice where I was like, I don't want to do another surgery because I had seven surgeries in my career, you know, yeah. and the process of coming back from injuries that, you know, it, it's a tough one. It's one of the toughest things in sports, you know, when, when you have a numerous of them you get to the point where you're like, I don't know if I can do it anymore. I really, I thought I'm, I, I know I'm strong and I probably could do it, but I was just so tired of it. Um, and then, you know, and Fotis was a great coach. And the year before I had shot us as my coach and it was to the point where I'm like, I'm sitting on the sidelines and I realized I'm getting basketball from like a coaching perspective. I'm like, mm -hmm. this is interesting. I might want to coach, you know, like I might want to take this and, you know, apply this because I started understanding it and whatnot. But, but yeah, to answer your question, last two or three months of that season, those thoughts started creeping in to where it was one month left or so. I came back home and I told my wife, this is going to be the last month in basketball for me. Like, and, she, she, you know, she thought I'm going to play for another three years or so. So it was a bit of a shock for her and it took a little time for her, but you know, then she, she was on board and you know, that last month of basketball, I really enjoyed it. You know, every practice that I could do, I was, yeah. I was really enjoying it every, and it was pretty cool because I told, I told Fotis that I told my team that, you know, that my last game is going to be in Valencia. Um, it's going to be my last game in my career. I knew it. And, you know, and the team played for me. <laughs> and we beat Valencia, the ultimate champions of the ACB that year. And, you know, everybody was like just jumping around on me. And, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like it was a very cool, like there's yeah. even a video clip, you know, at the end of, uh, you know, at, uh, of, of that game. But just, you know, guys are just kind of like celebrating me. And um, it was a touching moment. It was good to go out with a win. But, yeah, I was, you know, my mind was set. And then I have to tell you, you know, when I retired and I made an announcement, you know, whether it's Instagram, whatever, such a weight off my shoulders came off mm -hmm. and at that point I knew it was the right decision I knew it was the right decision I was finally you know I could do whatever and it was just um it was time I really I mean I truly believe that I gave everything I had to basketball you know and my career was short it was like you know a flash in the pan but you know I just gave it all and I do not regret much of it you know so um to answer your 
you know, question long story short, yeah, I kind of knew last couple of months of the season that um, I was going to retire. It's a, it's a beautiful farewell that way to yeah. end it. Like when you, you are like, you're, sounds like you were at peace with yourself at that point and you were ready to, to take the next step and enjoy, enjoy the ride, the last ride, you know, like it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a great ending to a great career where you kind of see it coming and then you kind of walk through the tunnel. I mean, I'm, I'm describing it now, like you're done, <laughs> but, right. but you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But now as a, like, maybe that's a good cue word to dying. Like, I mean, I'm not going to talk about dying, but identity because your one identity dies and a new one begins. So it's actually, I was on a good track there to have a good transition <laughs> without knowing yeah. it. Um, did you, I got my identity stolen um as a player when i finish uh, abruptly but also credit cards i got my identity stolen so it's a kind of similar thing where you get your identity taken away from you and now you have to create a new one uh, and basically find your new path whether it's also with your family to 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 orient yourself which direction to go so take me through the first steps after after the season when the summer started where how were you preparing for the next steps were you reflecting were you just taking it slow were you thinking about the next steps and what was the uh, like identity did you have an identity loss did you feel like you're you're a different person all of a sudden um it's hard to say because like i said you know i i was becoming to peace um you know with stopping playing basketball for the last three four months you know um so i did not feel out of place but i did not know what i'm gonna do you know mm -hmm. i knew it was gonna be i wanted to be in basketball and like i said you know last couple of months just watching um watching basketball from the side and watching these good coaches, you know, whether it was shot us and taking everything from him and then fought this. Um, I thought, I really thought I wanted to coach and it's crazy because my whole career, I said, I'm never coaching ever, ever <laughs> because my dad was a coach and I saw, I saw what, you know, what it is to coach and you know yeah. what it does to the family. And it's, it's, it's a hard job. And you always say like, in, in a sense, you almost have to be a maniac to be a coach, you know, yeah. just because it's, I mean, it's, it's different. Um, you have to enjoy that pain, you know, that just the process, the grind, the, yeah. you know. Um, but, you know, I I had this weird dream of, hey, maybe, you know, all this international basketball that I have knowledge about, I could maybe just, uh, for some reason, I wanted to co uh, coach college, you know. <laughs> the last month or two, I was like, that's my dream. I want to coach college and bring international basketball to to the States, you know, but obviously, you know, can't get a head coaching job. In college or whatever. <laughs> um, and, you know, I had a couple offers to where I could, could have been like a video coordinator for like a low major D1 team and stuff like that. Um, but I was open to everything. I was open to high school. I was open to uh, player development, you know, whatever, whatever offer came my way, I probably would have taken it. But I kind of knew that I wanted to try in the States because my wife was like, Hey, I, I wouldn't mind living in the States for a couple of years. Um, and it just happened so that, you know, Tommy is, you know, my best friend and we, you know, we always stayed in touch constantly and he was at the nuggets already for how many years. And I told him before I retired, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, stop playing. And, um, so he was already kind of working his angle to possibly bringing me in. Um, but I literally, you know, so I just did a lot of stuff that summer as far as transition. I went to Vegas and just, I was just there, you know, for the summer league and just meeting people. I took this uh, sports business classroom class that's just, you know, salary cap and scouting and all yep. that, all the stuff over there. Um, I met a lot of people and I was just kind of open to everything. And it was, it was kind of between two um jobs at that point it, no official offers no nothing but it was either a player development position on one nba team or possibly you know the front office position with with the nuggets um and i was set on doing the player development but that that kind of just disappeared and you know the nuggets job kind of happened um and ever since i got that job i'm so thankful i did not get into coaching <laughs> because <laughs> i absolutely love what i'm doing right now and i love the you know the the front office the scouting yeah. um i'm i'm really glad you know i did not go the, the other route so it was 
in a way blessing this guys that it just happened that you know i got, I got lucky to, to get a job with with the nuggets yeah it's it's uh coaching is a big sacrifice on both ends so you sacrifice on the personal end a lot uh whether it's free time whether it's family time whether it's personal life but you also sacrifice a lot of your health and 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 mental health and physical health um while you're going through the pain the pain and pleasure in basketball in terms of coaching is, is so close you know it's so close and it's that's why like the pain is so hard and the, and the, the pleasure is so high and then that's what it draws you always back into it because it's once you experience that the adrenaline rush the same thing as a player which in the front office you get less of you you keep getting drawn into it because this this passion being close to the core being close and, and successful and and feeling the success just i guess to to you know to end that point with um uh where you said that about the identity you know i think i it, my identity really changed when i got this job as far as you know i think if i went mm -hmm. into the coaching or pd like you said it would have been same, more or less the same as a basketball player or a coach you know it's yeah you know, you're working towards wins and, you know, the high highs and low lows. And it's the kind of the same thing again. But then, you know, I got the front office job and then I get to go to work and sit in my cubicle from nine to five every day. And I tell you what, like, I was the happiest person in the world. You know, really just going in the office, sitting in the traffic, driving to my <laughs> office, sitting down in my cubicle, opening laptop and doing something you know, not physical, I was the happiest person in the world. I, I, you know, like I told my wife and she saw it because she saw how miserable I was last two years playing, you know, going yeah. through all the injuries and everything. Yeah. And then, you know, I come back like it's Sunday night and Monday is around the clock and I'm like, I can't wait to go to work. I'm excited. <laughs> you know? so, um, for me, it was really, that's when I knew I really gave everything to the basketball as far as like physical and mental, you know, being on the court. And I, I tell you to this day, I do not miss playing basketball. I do not miss practicing twice a day. I do not miss going through that. I like playing a little pickup when I want to, you yeah. know, when, when I'm dragged into it, let's say. Um, <laughs> like summer, but, league, summer league camp? <laughs> whatever it is, you know, like what, you know, whether it's playing with the guys, with the coaches or whatever. But, you know, there's a, now, now there's a balance. If I want to play, I will go and play. If I want to, no, thank you. You know, you're content you're content i'm very content yeah with where i'm at and you know doing my own thing as far as like staying in shape and but yeah like going to the office and sitting in the office and not having to do that physical grind and pound yeah. every single yeah. day i was so so happy to change that kind of identity and you know and also you know by being a basketball player in lithuania for a long time and you know i used to hate when you know you play in joggers for example and you lose a yearly game or something like you cannot go out to the mall for the next two days you feel embarrassed yeah. you're you know if there's fans everywhere everybody recognizes you and that kind of it was a hard part in a sense you know especially like the last year when like i said you know my mom passed away and was a hard season and everything i hated everything about it you know and then coming here to the states when you're just a regular dude nobody knows your name nobody knows who you are and you're just sitting in your cubicle yeah. and just like you're an average joe i absolutely adored it i have to tell you like it was <laughs> the best thing for me ever and it sounds weird but you know, I, i was like i wanted it you know like and just and i'm sorry i'm rambling you know but just like even things like on game days let's say if we come to the office like we can wear sweats you know yeah. sweats sweatshirts sweats yeah. and you know people like that the casual fridays or whatever it is I wore sweats my whole life. Like I enjoy right now, you know, putting a polo on or a shirt yeah. on, and the pants, yeah, you know, yeah. like a, just a regular clothes. Cause I wore that my whole life. And it's just like, so I really enjoyed, you know, the, the normalcy of the life of the office life. And whatnot. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was definitely uh, probably the best thing that could have happened for me mentally, physically and all that. Yeah. Office life. Like as long as you have, like, we've talked about it a lot too um, with, with my people, with my, my colleagues. It's also about the, um, the colleagues that you have, the, 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 the people you have around day to day that make the work also enjoyable and the process also worth the whole journey. Because in the end of the day, the people make the difference. It's not necessarily the right. result. The result is just the, the cherry on a Sunday, but the people on the road to the to the final to the to, to the championship to get what you really seek for and what you work for 
Um, have you seen Have you seen the Michael Sch Schumacher documentary on uh, not Netflix? Yet, not yet. Not oh, yet. It's on like to watch list on Netflix. Yeah. I I, uh, I I got I cried. I cried yesterday because I, I grew up watching him, and it's it shows you yeah. also how much he included. There's a two parts where he was from Benetton and then for Ferrari. And for Ferrari, the journey, journey, I don't want to give it away, just some spoiler alert here, but it was very don't difficult. <laughs> but how much he included the team, you know, and how everybody felt involved in the process. And that's sign of a true leader, but it's also it's also shows you the the you know that at the end, when everybody feels a part of something, at the end, this is what matters more than the final. The final result is then just like, I mean, all all tears break loose because you that's what you work for but within the process you have a you you enjoy the whole uh repairing whatever it is like the the this when we go back to basketball the discussions you have the day-to-day -day interactions the the jokes the you know and, and at the end of the day when you get to the result and you had the right people around you without having the the in the the behind the back talk the the negative right. talk like all this just makes life miserable on day to day and and i'm fortunate and you're fortunate i believe that we're both in, a, in, in, in the in the in the right environments to experience it you know where i've also seen it differently and i also heard a lot of different things from other european based teams where you feel like oh like i do not want to live through that you know like and and i'm yeah. fortunate and 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 really blessed but i was wondering uh we're both are but i was wondering it was always. It seems like it was always basketball after retirement. There was no other thoughts. Did you have any other interests or or passions outside of basketball that you kind of thought of um, um, pursuing? Not really. Not seriously. Just because I knew, you know, my whole life wasn't basketball. I knew I can give give something back, back to basketball. Yeah. You know. So for me, it was. You know, that's the only thing that I really knew well. Um, obviously, you know, the adjusting to to the MBA and learning ins and outs and, you know, of the scouting or whether it's front office or salary cap, those things, you know, that was a growth part of me, you know, but, but, uh, and I'm still learning, you know, but uh, yeah, I knew that I had to give something back to basketball because that's where I had the most knowledge, you know, and that's why I was even thinking about uh, coaching in the first place. So really, uh, no, it was really, really basketball. Just I didn't know which angle, you know, where mm -hmm. I might be able to help. But I felt like uh, it is going to be basketball. So let's talk. Let's talk about coaching then a little bit, because coaching um, in an aspect. I mean, I've been I've been doing that for for quite a while on the side, <laughs> like the side side gig. Uh, but in terms of your career, you had you were fortunate um, to, to play for some of the highest level coaches um, in basketball. And, um, you know, four years under Coach K, then uh, two years under Coach uh, Pablo Lasso, uh, national team with Kozlowskis in particular, uh, that I wanted to, you know, uh, mention here as well. Do you feel can you can you name me some common denominators? Uh, between those those three in particular and on the other side something that they distinguish themselves from the rest there's two parts to this question um so i think they're very different you know um but there's you know there's a lot of coaches i had and some are for example i always say this about coach k and hopefully he doesn't listen to this podcast you know but <laughs> I hope he does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I always say that, you know, Coach K was the best coach I've ever had in the sense of, like I always say, I don't think he's great X's and O's coach, you know, because uh, if you look at his systems, like they still run to this day the same stuff that we ran in 05, 06. Yeah. Um, but he's probably the best coach and the teacher from the sense of, you know, uh, psychologist almost to where he when he talks you listen he has mm -hmm. something about it to where he knows how to bring everybody on the same page he knows how to motivate you he knows how, how to push your buttons to to really to believe in him and in the program and in you know the he always said you know duke or the basketball is bigger than one person you know it's all about the team about the bigger picture and all that so the life lessons that I learned in four years, you know, while playing at Duke or almost like not playing at Duke, you know, I, I barely played really. Um, but I never really thought about transferring as weird as it sounds, you know, 
Um, and so that's why, you know, as far as Coach K goes, you know, that's, that's one thing where I know if you're not necessarily, let's say, um, an excellent top level um, X's and O's coach, you can still have a tremendous success if you're an amazing leader and teacher and psychologist uh, and all those things, you know, because I had a ton of coaches who, who are amazing in X's and O's, but let's say they were awful leaders or awful, um, you know, psychologists or whatever. And, and I tell you, like, I did not enjoy playing for them. You know, I yeah. did not want to fight for them. I did not yeah. want to give my all to them. So yeah. I think there's a fine balance and there's very few coaches that are, you know, really good into both things, um, both X's and O's and basketball and strategies and also uh, making you believe into what you're playing for and, you know, making you feel, giving you confidence, all that kind of stuff. Um, so um i've had a lot of coaches you know and all of them are a little different but like i said you know it took a lot from from each one of them yeah but um, uh what do you what do you think um like because coach lasso was also somebody that i you know i got to scout when i was in moscow um and you see also him playing a lot of the same sets year in right. year out out of the horn sets right. the diamond sets that he runs for jc carroll and or yeah. i mean while when he was playing um, what do you think that Coach Lasso made uh, made Coach Lasso special during the time that you were there? Because it's also a certain, some, to a certain degree simplicity, but I think there's also a lot of uh, psychology involved in terms of like freedom and and uh, adapting and and communicating with the players in a certain way. Where um, we also have to consider that it's uh, the the Spanish culture that you have to also integrate because you know certain styles don't fit outside the country that you play or certain communication styles. So what was right. Pablo Lasso's um, style of reaching the players and making having them bought in as Coach K had his players buy in into Duke? Right. So those two, I would say, very similar in that regard. You know, <laughs> because I mean Pablo Lasso is great X is nose coach, but let's say he's not. I wouldn't put him in my top two, top three in Europe. You no, know? but I think he's one of the best coaches as far as. Um, having guys to buy in and yeah. you know when, when you have 14 or 15 guys that can start for you any single game it's difficult it's very hard to manage egos you know and manage and having guys to stay ready and to believe in it so I think um, um, he's very good at um, you know navigating that type of stuff where, mm -hmm. um, you know he he will talk to you on the side he will you know, you may not play in your league on Thursday or Friday and you're all down and then all of a sudden you're starting in ACB the next game and you're mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're back up, you know, and you're ready. And so he's, um, I would say he, he's done and obviously he's done an amazing job, you know, because, you know, you look at the track record since he got to Real Madrid, yeah. you know, all yeah. the championships and trophies and everything, but it's, you know, I think he's done a tremendous job just navigating uh personalities and egos and while on top you know at the, still coaching at the high level and you know having an x's and o's but yeah um i think he's uh you know he's he's very good at that um, i think i think if i might add to that i don't i never met him i never i just saw him from the outside and then scouted him uh, a lot but um, in terms of like you said navigating and managing all the personalities and all the de the depth of a, of a roster there's a lot of intuition that comes to it intuitive coaching intuition in terms of personality like you said you're not playing you're down he sees that he feels that you have to have a a feel not only feel for the game but feel for humans feel for the for the players Correct. and you have to also be able to relate to them in 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 mm -hmm. the same language and you see because as as a former player you also feel what the player is feeling right. so i think from the outside, it looks like that's his biggest strength in terms of like having the intuition and feeling what the player feels and, and get him, em, empowering him or them. Empowering them, yeah. And, and another thing is, you know, giving players freedom, you know, mm -hmm. because like I, I was always fascinated with Spanish basketball style, so to speak. You know, remember all those national teams where they just played fast and, you know, yeah. transition threes and that kind of stuff. And it's that's not coached you know like for example us as lithuanians we're all about the schemes and you know the you know just 
first Ex action, execu second executing, action, third yeah. action, execution, executing until you have the best shot. You know, Spain, Spain and Spanish basketball is so different as far as you know. Just you have yeah. a lot of talented players, and you give give them the keys to the basketball and to you know to the freedom and since they're high level basketball players, they execute and they, so he, he, he did a lot of that where it's, you know, there's, there's sets or there's certain guidelines, but there's a ton of room for improvisation, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. guys improv. And, and I think, you know, naturally, organically, that kind of, you know, you find the best way and best basketball, you know, in, in that sense, but also, you know, I do remember one great example where, I can't remember it was my first year or second year, but you know, it was in the middle. Of, it was a grind of the season. It was February or early March. To dog one, days. One dog those. days. Dog days. Exactly. The dog days. And maybe we lost a couple of games or whatever. And I remember we went to Malaga. And, you know, even in Madrid at that, at that point in February, or whatever, the weather is crappy and it's cold. I um, mean, you go to Malaga and it's sunny and it's nice, you know, and we play a game and we, I believe we lost the game, you know. And I'm used to a lot of this, you know, where you lose, it's, you know, the head is down, you're going to have a hard practice next day and this and that. And, and he comes in the locker room and he's basically like, listen, guys, like we, we need to reset. We need to. Um, so he basically just tells us, hey, get dressed, get showered. We go to the hotel. If you want to eat, you know, eat dinner there or, you know, whatever. It was actually lunch because it was a you know, noon game in ACB, but. He's like, you know, you can eat lunch, whatever there, but guys go not out, out, but like go have a couple of beers, you yeah. know, just whether it's all of you, whether yeah. it's in couples or whatever, go enjoy it. We don't have, you know, our train is not until like next morning or something like that. Like go reset, you reset, know, we'll yeah. have a day off tomorrow. Um, but just really, you know, we need to kind of, you know, the, the grind and the pounding that's not working. So, Hey, go, you know, coach saying you like, go have a couple of beers. You're like, wow, like, okay, you know, <laughs> sky's not falling, but yeah. it can be better. And then I yeah. remember after that point, we just took off, you know, and yeah. we went to the final four of the EuroLeague and it was just, um, so the little examples, you know, of just like how you can, as a coach, just kind of change the, you know, the, the perspective or the, you know, the morale of the players and the team, you know. Again, so, intuition, intuition. Yeah. I, I, like he, and, and honest to himself, because some some coaches, I believe, they they may be feeling it and seeing what the team needs, the freedom to to reset or to just get away, but just can't get over them. That that they have to work, you have to put in hours, you have to ex do extra, and then there's a tipping point where it's just like there's no there's no re there's no returning after that, you know. So right. I think that speaks to his strength to being able to be honest to himself and seeing what he sees and like actually following through with 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 his thoughts and and giving the team the freedom because at the end they pay you back they give you give them the freedom right. they pay you back right. if they don't they don't play you know so it's it's i 100%. think it's it's something that um i've seen it happen also in my own eyes and i feel like that's um modern day basketball and a true honesty you you hold them accountable but you also give them the freedom to 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 be themselves and to see that certain things are not working and we have to change and we have to maybe loosen loosen the strings a little bit to give them a little bit of uh, breathing room 100 percent. even you know even guy like uh Shadas or even pa pablo Lassa, i remember when you know we would come to to practice and you think you're going to have a hard practice and all of a sudden we we play soccer instead <laughs> you know and then it's just like the mood lights up and yeah. everybody's happy and you're just but i remember shadas used to do that a lot maybe coach crap because you know i'm yeah. so yeah. like those things help you know where you completely like for one day you reset you change you know the the grind the everyday you know stress and all that and just kind of reset so those things definitely help you know i've seen yeah. i've seen and i've felt it yes yes i agree uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the assistant coaches you had through, throughout your career. Um, there's no uh, like particular name or anybody that I I would like would want you to point out, but I would like you to point out something that you expected from assistant coaches and you got from assistant coaches, and something that you may have uh, missed or or experience something uncalled for um i have done something uncalled for during the games and i the players told me that's not what we need right now because i was like still in germany i was i was i was very um upset in a moment where i should have just like you know like it's the first five minutes three minutes let's calm down like you know and i was really yeah. 
And, you know, so certain things that maybe you, you, you expect from assistant coaches and you got in, in terms of like maybe scouting information or, or pre preparation and certain things that you felt like were out of place or you, 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 you didn't get. I guess I would say in the most basic terms, and it's probably going to be a short answer and then we can probably kind of discuss it. But for me, I think being a good assistant coach is, um, is being the bridge between the head coach and the players. You know, mm -hmm. and what I mean from that is, uh, you know, if, if the coach, if the head coach is a bad cop, you need a good cop as well, mm -hmm. you know, as far as, because if it's all, I do remember days when, you know, you're, you're getting all the crap from head coach, you're getting, you know, MF and all this, and then the assistant coach comes in and then he pounds on top of that. You just want to, you just want to quit and leave and never come back, yeah. you know, but other times, you know, when you have an assistant coach that comes to you and really is, you know, in your ear in a good way, like, Hey, yeah. everything's okay. You know, like he almost, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, he, this is the coach or whatever, but it's, you know, it's that bridge of good cop, bad cop. And, you know, when assistant coaches, I think, you know, it's very important for assistant coaches to have built good relationships with players, you know, in the sense of like, you have an authority as a coach, but at the same time, if you have players that trust you, that if there's something wrong and players can come to you and, Hey, I'm struggling with this or, you know, because as a head coach, you have to overlook, you have to oversee so many things, yeah. you know, and sometimes you lose, lose the side of smaller things, you know, like, players struggling in practice you're just you know hey struggling to practice you need to practice harder well no maybe there's something off the court maybe yeah. there's you know everybody goes through their own issues so i think you know um if you're an assistant coach or one of assistant coaches and you can be that bridge you know that good cop um and also knowing you know picking your parts when to be a when you be tough when to be good um, but also, you know, having built relationships with players um, where, you know, players feel comfortable maybe coming to you and telling you something that they wouldn't necessarily tell a head coach or mm -hmm. something that you almost keep as an assistant coach and don't share with a head coach. Yes, you know, yes, yes. I, I think those things are very important. You know, I think those are the best uh, assistant coaches to have to where, you know, as a player, you you know you can trust them and you know there's there's that sort of camaraderie um if you will so um those are at least my experiences yeah and i have to um double up on that because i i, I agree with you that the uh, assistant coach is a bridge and there's like a filter uh, in certain in certain regards of what to say or what not it's because the coach doesn't need to hear everything and he doesn't doesn't want to know everything you know and if you tell him accidentally that he doesn't want to know it's you planted the bug that you didn't need to plant. So it's on the assistant coach to really build a relationship and to be a genuine relationship, a trustworthy relationship, because you see it and you see it, like we're meeting with players, with former players. And it's just like it's a, it's a friendship. It's a professional friendship where it goes beyond the court because you've went through the um, losses, you went through the pains, you shared, you open up. And I'm generally an open person as it is. So I found it I found it very um, easy to relate to to different cultures as well because I, I I grew up in different in different parts of the world but it's also in terms of the the trust that you gain through being open yourself first because right. as an assistant coach you also if you're putting on a show or face that you're like you you're you're not you're not sh uh, you're afraid to be vulnerable the player is going to look through it and they're going to keep this distant to you as well I was from the beginning always in any relationship. I felt more like a player than a coach early on. And it's always been a natural flow in terms of opening up. So I was like, I, I felt that it's it's also something I wanted as a as a as a player, you know, like the having that relationship, mm -hmm. that friend on the staff that you kind of you, you, you can't tell the coach during the game something, but you can tell the assistant who then in turn has to process it. And is like, yeah, right. maybe like he's right. And I tell the coach in this year. And, you know, this, so these dynamics are very important. And I think a lot of people underestimate that, that what's, what's actually, you know, like the dynamics within the coaching staff and the players. And there's a lot of, lot of intertwining going on. And like you yeah. said, the assistant coach is 
it's the key it's the key factor i think in that in that um um season or, or team whatever you want to call it i 100 agree i think it's very intricate and you know to be a good assistant coach that i mean there's a lot that goes into it you know and you have to be a good coach good psychologist good you know just a person in general um but yeah in the sh like in a very abstract thing like I, if i have to go back right now you know all the coaches that i still stay in touch with like not on daily basis but you know do they feel comfortable reaching out are all the assistant coaches that i had great rela relationships with you know mm -hmm. like it's not necessarily i'm not gonna uh i'm not gonna i don't know like reach out to to somebody that you know was my head coach but then i remember you know somebody on their staff that i yeah. was really yeah. good friends and you know stay in touch with to this yeah. day so you know as a way in in a way as an assistant coach you're also building relationships that you know friendships the players you're trust you friendships. Yeah, and, yeah. and you build that friendship yeah it lasts for for a long time yeah know? so 100 uh, percent yeah and it's it's like at the end i don't look at the basketball world as a business like there's a lot of people look at it as a business but i look at it as a community where you actually like Obviously, there is some bad apples in every community that you find, you know, that you don't want to have anything to do with or you felt like they did you wrong at some point. But in general, this community that we're both li working and living in, it's it's a good, good structure, good, good people around. You know, the majority, they want to help. They f feel like if you are in trouble, they will look away. They might not help you right away. They, they, they will look for ways to help you if you're in trouble. Um, so. The relationship, relationships you build throughout your career early on, they will carry you a long way throughout your career in terms of on, on a friendship level. And it, of course, there's some people may see it as a competitiveness, but I always see it as people's people first. And then from there, you can you can branch out in whatever like whatever uh, level you want to take your friendship at too. 100% I agree. And it's, you know, if you look at the broader spectrum, um, you know, those things, for me, it's all, I always said, like, it's all about who you know, almost, you know, so yeah. when you build those relationships, and you, I mean, you know, as a player, let's say I got along with, with a certain, let's say, assistant coach or whatever, and, you know, we stayed in touch, and I really trust him and believe in him as a person and as a friend, you know, life goes on, and, you know, now I'm not playing anymore, now, let's say I'm in the NBA, or wherever the case might be, you know, you remember those people you remember those yeah. coaches and that's yeah. how you know that's how assistant coaches get hired some somewhere else you know yeah. and that's how you know i think if you're a good person and a good coach there's way more likelihood for you to you know when you don't have a job anymore to get a new job like just yes. like that because yeah. you know you've built some cachet with you know with certain people that now moved on with their life or are in your yeah. position stuff like that so it's it's all organic and it's definitely helpful it's it's about the the substance of it. You know, we go back to the, the what we talked about the front office, the office relationships day to day. You have people right. you trust. You want to take them with. You want to be with them. So whatever is somebody is you know without a job and you know is a good person by heart, you will eventually you know like want to want to have them around. You know in whatever capacity. Um, right. be before we we get off, I have three more questions for you. Three quick uh, ATOs that I've drawn up for you. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's nothing it's nothing intricate. It's um, one philosophical question is where do you because of, after playing after going through all this where do you find meaning these days uh, apart from family and apart from maybe um, you know like the front office work where do you find uh, the most meaning in 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 your life right now? I'm sure me, family is the is the biggest biggest bulk of your, of your meaning yeah 100%. so apart apart from that where where do you see like you feel like you, you really get your peace um that's a good question um you know for me it's all I always say for me it's all about the balance um so i try to have as much balance as i can in the sense of um so i i got into running a little bit or it's more of just you know form of like i remember when covid first hit and, you know, you're supposed to be home all day. Like, you can really go crazy. So, so for me, yeah. it was, you know, I was never a runner. Like, I hated running. And then I slowly kind of got into it and into it to, where the, to the point where, you know, I ran a half marathon last summer. And, like, wow. I actually can, you know, just – I do run every single day right now. And it's for me, it's really – if I don't run that day, I'll be cranky and I'll be 
you know, it's just, it's not going to be a good day. But if that's one of the things that I get done in the morning, like I have a better day. So for me, it's, you know, almost like clearing my head and have, you know, being with my own thoughts and, you know, getting that, uh, not the unnecessary energy, but just, you know, the, I don't know, I just feel more balanced in that way. Um, but at the same time, like I said, balance for me is, you know, um, uh, I don't even know how to put it, but it's, you know, I do not go to the extremes, you know, to where it's, I'm not vegan. I'm not, you know, I'm not like I work hard or let's say work out hard. Like I will go and let's say take for example yesterday i woke up and i ran eight miles or 13 kilometers and then i had my own day you know and then i came back at night and i watched netflix and i had two cocktails you know and i just you know so it's for me it's 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 balance of having yeah. both you know because yeah. if you go too extreme to one place you know and then you're just um you're working out and healthy living and this and that but you don't enjoy you know you don't let you don't let yourself to relax let's say at the end of the day it, it might not be healthy also you know or if you just completely forget working out and get fat and yeah yeah you know get into let yourself go the case might, yeah. yeah you know it's also bad so for me it's all about balance you know guys yeah. people will i'll see like people go to a restaurant and you know have dinner or whatever and then desserts like ah nah this dessert's <laughs> bad for me and i'm like well if i feel like it i'll have a dessert because i know i also work hard to yeah know, to, to yeah. maintain my body and work out and burn calories so so for me it's all about the balance but yeah it, long story short i kind of you know find myself into you know whether it's running or lifting and kind of you know i i do because i remember um, after I stopped playing honestly for about a year or a year and a half i did not want to do anything you know i was yeah. pushed every single day you know yeah yeah and then all of a sudden you you're nobody's telling you you have to go to practice nobody's <laughs> telling you have to do this and i was so relieved into like okay i'm not gonna do anything and then you know a year year and a half after you start looking in the mirror you're like <laughs> this is not supposed to okay, be that way <laughs> this is not gonna be good if i keep, keep this you know so so then you know you get back into it and find that balance so right now i would say yeah, i'm really balanced and happy and find my piece in there so you so you actually from being a gym rat and only knowing zero or hundred percent you learned to have a 50 50 balance exactly exactly nice. that's uh, nice. it's been a big 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 thing for me i think yeah that's good that's good i i'm still trying to learn how to unwind but um, my girlfriend is teaching me that as well so <laughs> i'm, I'm yeah. i i need to get on the other side as well because like i feel like sometimes when i'm not doing something productive i feel like i'm useless so right. I have this, this, um, it's, it's not good, but, <laughs> uh, and it's like the, 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 what you said, like to straining yourself every day to do something hard every day is important just to, um, exhaust yourself to a certain degree, because I think it's also, there's also a physio physiological need for us to do that. Our bodies were made to do that. I can't explain the hormonal effects, but there's definitely something going on there where you can feel a difference after you did something hard. The, the hormones, you know, they, they come up, you know, you have, you have, you're, you're sweating, you're, you're actually like your, 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 um, uh, your body has done some work and you feel like you did something, something good today. So I think that's, it's very important for everybody before they go to the doctor or before they uh, throw some pills into them for feeling bad, they need to work out hard uh, or at least yeah, break and, a sweat. I mean, listen, and a lot of people I think want to do that and want to start and they do start but you know the results come so slowly yeah that yeah. a lot of people just give up before they see the results you know yeah. and it's i remember i hated running for the first year i ran i just i hated it. every you know every time i went out i hated it to the at some point you know whether it's six months after that eight months after something clicked to where i'm like i'm running i'm like holy crap i'm actually enjoying this right now you know so <laughs> Um, and then, you know, you see a body change and you feel better and, you know, you, you really feel the difference, you know, when you don't yeah. work out or, you know, don't like, you don't feel as good as when you went out and, you know, did cardio or whatever the case might be. It's just, yeah, it's, yeah. um, it's, it's sticking with it. You know, I think it's, you know, because everybody wants to start, but it's so hard until you, when you don't see the results, it's, uh, it's a tough process. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, second ATO, um, and f for you, it may be more 
what you did after retirement and you could advise other uh, players, ex-players to do so, but anything around the term retirement, whether it's before, during, or after, is there one single most important advice you can give to, to next uh, athletes retiring? Um, so I would say, honestly, uh, I mean, listen, it's the life changes a lot, you know, and I feel like if you're smart or, you know, I guess my advice would be years before retirement already start having some sort of, not necessarily one direction, but different directions of, you know, I remember probably two years or three years before I retired, I started jogging down notes of, you know, what could I possibly be doing after basketball? You know, yeah. a lot of non-basketball things and, you know, none of them materialized, but I think, you know, if you all of a sudden retire, let's say you didn't plan it and, you know, you retire and you don't have a backup plan, it can get depressing, I'm sure, yeah. you know, because all, everything that you knew now all of a sudden changes and, and now you don't even have anything, you know, I guess the best thing that could have happened for me is that I got a job right away, you know, hmm. two or three months after I finished playing and I got a job right away. And even better thing that happened was a job in basketball. You know, but I think uh, some people need to really, you know, take a year and to do nothing. But I think um, it's tough, you know, going from that uh, thing of a basketball player where every day is so structured to having this whole all freedom. You know, I think it's still good to have some sort of structure, whether it's, like I said, an office job or whether it's a project or um, you know, you want to become an entrepreneur or something like, I think you need to have structure still, you know, you might have, you, you can take a month, two months or three months off, but I think the sooner you get back into some sort of structure, you know, whether it's a job, whether it's uh, whatever the case might be, I think the better because, um, you know, we're just wired. We, we play basketball for our whole lives for 20 plus years. And all of a sudden it just stops to where you have zero structure. Uh, mentally that can be very very hard you know so like i said i'm very lucky that i got a job and a job in the basketball right away in some sort of structure i define it as purpose of of having purpose again and finding uh your, your new role and where you feel like you're needed you know and sammy sammy right. mejia um two episodes ago he said that uh he, same thing like he, he was thinking about just like sitting on it and letting it letting it just you know see what pops in and not really stressing but he was anyway it was the pandemic so he couldn't go anywhere but he clearly and f quickly realized that he needs to get back into it quicker and and some sort of capacity with some structure also but mostly because the longer you sit on it the more it's going to be you know like your head is going to go crazy of, of all the little things that pop into your head so he found it also more uh, productive and more healthy to get right into it and start something right away just to have um, something going in terms of like, you know, purpose and some role, some something that you where you can grind and, and have some uh, some sort of um, yeah, day to day job, you know, and I think that's really exactly. Im important for sure, for sure. I think so. Yeah. So last question, and uh, it's somebody that every 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 um, every guest has a, a a dot on my map. On my map, I call it a pot map on my on my page. And uh, on where which city you would like to be belong to, which city are you seeing as your home, or which city you realize you maybe it's a little bit politically correct question for you here <laughs> to to see where you want to have it placed. But I don't think it's a big deal. It's just a a, a pin that I put on on the city where you would like to be. Oh my gosh. Um, I don't know. That's a very tough one, you know, because I have, I feel like I have three homes or, yeah. you know, I feel like where I'm home. One is, um, when I'm back at Duke, I feel like I'm at home. Mm. Two is here sitting in a home in Denver, you know, and three is definitely Vilnius. Um, mm. um, if, if I had to really like think hard, I think at heart, I'm, um, it's Lithuania first always for me, you know, yeah. um, and it's home and it's family and it's everything. So uh, I would say it's business for me because, you know. Judging by your shirt too. Lithuania, big, yeah. I mean, big time. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I don't know why, but yeah, I'm always Lithuania at the heart. And, you know, like I said, like I, I absolutely love the job that I'm doing right now. And I'm, you know, in Denver and it's, 
and it's amazing, but you always, you know, you always follow Lithuania, Lithuanian basketball, you always want to help any way you can. Yeah. You know, any way you can, you want to help and be involved. And, because I think it's, you know, just the pride, the national pride. Of I think course. There's nothing, nothing course. more important than, than, you know, your country. Yeah, for me, it was it, like the home question is always a weird one because I've grew up and lived in so many different places. And it's always like the, I, I would have trouble answering that question that I asked you of ter in terms of like, where do I see myself as my home? Because I do feel homeless in a sense. And it's not a bad thing for me. Right. I feel yeah. like world world citizen in many yeah, regards, citizen. but it's also it's good and bad at the same time because it's good. You have so many doors open, you can feel at home in so many places, but you never feel in depth at home at one place. And then there's there's some substance missing in the day to day surroundings, you know, because other people, like right. you said, they're working nine to five in, 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 in one place and they work and they have their whole community and they have their whole life circled around the same um, events, same same topics, you know, and I don't know whether I would go crazy or not, whether some, some people have find bliss in that, you know, and some people are, are feel too constrained. I mean, I may be too more too much on the constraint side, but I don't know. So for me, it's a hard yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, being a world citizen is not a bad thing, you know, just because it's like I said, basketball always has taken me to places, you know, to different countries and I've ex experienced um, different cultures and I think that's the best thing in life that you can that's the best education in life that you can yeah you can have is you know absolutely uh, experiencing different cultures different ways of living and languages I mean um, your horizon your perspective just is you know expands so so much so I think yeah. you know that's why I'm happy that my kids get to live in the states get to live in Lithuania get to you know go to school here there um it's just I think that's the best thing and gift that you can give your kids and uh, in general people you know just traveling and experiencing so um, yeah we're world citizens 1000 percent traveling and I'll see you on the road a lot this year and probably in Venice Absolutely. as well so uh, appreciate you coming uh, marty vic fly keep flying high in the mile high city i wanted to finish on that one <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it. we'll do it. all it's right great, uh, thanks for having me it's great thank you man that was very cool i appreciate it thanks mm -hmm. a lot take care take care